afternoon, and uh, as you can see, we are still in our series called The Power of Jesus. We're in message number 17. We're going to be in the book of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. And uh, the title of today's message is called Faithing the Storms of Life. And uh, that is absolutely not a typo. That is the uh, title of today's message because the truth is we all face storms in life. But the question is, do you have the ability to faith the storms of life, right? Do you have the kind of faith it takes to get through life when those storms come? Uh, Faith is more than a noun. Faith is absolutely a verb. Uh, Faith is an action. And because of that, faith is something that you and I are constantly pursuing in our Christian walks. Uh, Today we're going to look at Jesus and the disciples and uh, they're going to end up in a storm in our verses today. Uh, You know, we've got some storms going on outside right now today. And I got to tell you, I think one of the hardest jobs in the world uh, would be to be a weather forecaster. Uh, I used to go with a friend of mine named Charlie Matthews to a remote Indian reservation up in South Dakota. Uh, Charlie was an American Indian And uh, he took me there with him a couple of times. And uh, he used to tell this story about a Native American Indian chief uh, who uh, didn't want his the people in his tribe to know that he couldn't predict the weather. And uh, one time the people in the tribe asked him if he thought it was going to be a cold winter. And he said, I'll get back to you on that. What he did was he took off and kind of snuck away and he called the uh, National Weather Service. And he asked the guy, he said, hey, is it going to be a cold winter? And the guy from the National Weather Service said, we think it's going to be a cold winter. So he went back and told the people in the tribe to collect firewood. He said, you're going to have to to collect some firewood. So a couple of weeks later, before their next meeting, he called the National Weather Service again. He asked them, is you sure it's going to be a cold winter? They said, we're a little more certain that it's going to be a cold winter now. So he went back and he told the tribe, you need to collect more firewood. Well, about three weeks later, they were getting together again, so he called the National Weather Service, and he asked the guy, do you still think it's going to be a cold winter? The guy said, we're absolutely certain. It's going to be one of the coldest winters we ever had. Chief asked him, how do you know that? He said, the Indians up on the reservation are collecting firewood like crazy. (laughs) So, (laughs) So the weather, it's unpredictable, right? And in our text today, we're going to see that Jesus and his disciples are going to get involved in some inclement weather. Uh, What's happening here is Jesus and the disciples are planning to cross the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee, and I've seen it before, maybe some of you have, it's actually not a sea at all. The Sea of Galilee is a freshwater lake. It's about 600 feet below sea level. That makes it the lowest lake on the face of the earth, the lowest freshwater uh, lake on the face of the earth. Uh, and the Sea of Galilee, it's about 14 miles long and about seven miles wide. And it's shaped like a heart, as you can see on that slide right there, like a heart. And uh, on any given day or night, it would have taken the disciples, if they were sailing and rowing, it would have taken them about three hours to go across the Sea of Galilee. And so, just like the SS Minnow, these guys are about to go on a three-hour tour, Right. And the same thing happened to them that happened to those people on Gilligan's Island, right? The weather started getting rough. The tiny ship was tossed. Only in this case, if not for the courage of the fearless Lord, the disciples would be lost, right? The disciples would be lost. So let's look at our verses and let's see what's going on here. Uh, Mark 4, 35 through 41. It says, That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious storm came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? 
Even the wind and the waves obey him. Wow, so that's our verses for today. Now, one of my favorite pictures of this true account is actually a painting, uh, and it was painted by that Dutch master, famous Dutch master painter, uh, Rembrandt. And uh, this painting was painted in 632. And uh, this painting was actually displayed for many years in the Boston Museum of Art until it was stolen sometime in 1990. And its whereabouts are still unknown today. So if, if you're out there somewhere and you see this painting in a garage sale or in somebody's basement, you might want to call the FBI because there's a $5 million reward for any information that leads to its recovery. But what I want to do is I want to kind of focus on the picture itself right here, okay? We do see a, a tiny boat, right? And it's being tossed and it's being turned by the angry wind and the waves. But there's something else about this picture. If you look close, you can see Jesus in that picture, but you don't see 12 disciples in that picture. Instead, you see 13 disciples in that picture. And the reason for that is Rembrandt actually painted himself into the picture with the disciples. That's Rembrandt right there. He's a guy holding on to the rope right there. And it's like, it looks like he's looking right out of the painting at you, doesn't it? He's holding on the rope and he's wearing that famous little beret that he uh, always uh, wore. And if you look close, I know it's kind of hard to see, but if you look close down there, one of the disciples is hanging over the side of the boat. Obviously, he's, he's seasick, right? He's getting sick. There's a message here that I think Rembrandt is, is trying to convey with this painting. And it's this. If you look in the picture, what you see is you see some of the disciples up here and they're fighting the storm. Their focus is on the storm. But some of the other disciples over here, they're all gathered around Jesus. You see, their focus is on the Savior. Some of them are focusing on the storm. Some are focusing on the Savior. And so this picture, it really, it really asks the question, when you face the storms of life, do you fearfully focus on the storm? Or do you faithfully focus on the Savior? So today what we're going to do is we're going to learn five lessons about how you can faith the storms of life. And so one of the things that you have to understand as you faith the storms of life is this. You can be close to Jesus and you can absolutely still encounter storms. Jesus knew all things. Uh, he's called the Son of Man, so he has a human side, but he's also the Son of God, and he is God incarnate. And so when he said, let's go to the other side of this lake, well, he knew that they were going to encounter this storm. And I think it's a great message for you and I today because a lot of times people who follow Jesus, uh, people who really love the Lord, somehow they get this idea in their mind that they should be exempt from these stormy encounters, right? Right. Uh, some Christians, they make the mistake of thinking that just because they have the Lord in their life, uh, they're going to be immune to trouble and problems. But what you and I need to see today in this story is this, is that even though Jesus was in the boat, the storm still struck. And even though Jesus is in your life and my life, you are still going to encounter the storms of life. And those storms are going to come in different ways, right? They might be physical storms. It might come in the form of sickness and disease. Maybe it's financial storms. Maybe it's emotional storms. Could be relationship storms. But just like storms in the natural, these storms can strike suddenly and they can strike with no warning. But just because you find yourself in a storm, that does not mean that God doesn't love you and it doesn't mean that God is punishing you because that's not the God that you and I serve. Jesus actually allowed the disciples to go into this storm because he wanted to use it as a teaching moment. He wanted to teach them to trust him. And so when you and I face the storms of life, we really shouldn't be surprised. As a matter of fact, God tells us in the scripture we shouldn't be surprised. Check it out in the book of 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, verses 12 and 16. It says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. If you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Right? That's the greatest thing you can be called is a Christian. Jesus is the Christ. You and I are his followers. We're Christians. 
But you can just picture, even if I hadn't showed you that painting by Rembrandt, you can just picture that little boat in this storm, right? Wave after wave is crashing over the bow, right? The wind's howling and the thunder's crashing. And again, sometimes trouble, it comes into our lives like that. And I say this all the time. You and I, we're either in a storm, we're either walking out of a storm or walking right into the next storm. You, know, you might be between waves right now, but I guarantee you there's another wave coming. Uh, there was a cowboy on a ranch, and he was in the corral with this bull. All of a sudden, this bull started to chase him around the corral, and he saw a hole in the ground, and so he jumped down in this hole, and the bull ran by him. So he jumped back out of this hole and started running, and the bull started chasing him around the corral again. He jumped back in the hole. The bull went by him. He jumped out of the hole again, and this just kept going on. Uh, finally, this other cowpoke individual, he was leaning on the rail, and he said to the cowboy, Hey, man, why don't you just stay down in that hole? And that cowboy said, There's a rattlesnake down there. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, that's how trouble comes in our life sometimes too, right? And it might sound uh, uh, far-fetched, but look what the Scripture says. Look what the prophet Amos said about the day of the Lord. He said, It's going to be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear, as though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall, only to have a snake bite him. And so again, life can be tough. And you and I as Christians, just because we have Jesus in our lives, we are not immune from trouble, right? Trouble's going to come. The question again is, or do you have the kind of faith that it takes to meet that trouble head on? Because all of us are going to encounter storms. And that's going to take us to point number two. Well, when it comes to those storms, Jesus permits those storms, just like he did those first disciples, to test our faith. When the disciples woke Jesus up, he didn't just stop the storm right then. Instead, he used it as a teaching moment. He asked them a couple of questions. He said, why are you so afraid? And then he said, do you still have no faith? Now, you and I, we've been going through this book of Mark chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And if you remember in the chapter before this one, uh, Jesus taught a number of parables to the disciples. And those parables were all about faith, right? They were all about receiving Jesus' word into their hearts and, and growing in faith. And so like any good teacher... Jesus, he taught the lesson first. Now out here on the Sea of Galilee, he's going to give them the test. Uh, uh, the question is, are they going to trust him during the storm or is their faith going to fail? And again, God trusts our faith the same way a lot of times. And the reason he does that is because he wants to purify our faith. Let's go back to the book of uh, 1 Peter again, chapter 1, verse 7. When it comes to the trials of life, the scripture says these have come so that the proven genuine, genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. See, that's how it is. You know, sometimes for you and I, we live in this fallen world, and you and I are fallen. We are sinners, even if we're saved, we're still sinners. It's just that God doesn't see us as sinners anymore. When He looks at us, he sees the blood of Jesus covering us. You see, it's not our righteousness that takes us to heaven. It's that blood. It's Jesus' righteousness. And I always tell people that's why you can't lose your salvation because Jesus' blood can't lose its power. See, God's not blind. He knows that on this side of heaven, we're still able to be deceived. We can still fall into traps. And God's not the author of evil. He doesn't bring evil on us. But when evil does come, when we walk into it or accidentally stumble into it, God's going to draw his hand back sometime. And again, he's going to use that moment to test our faith. Sometimes uh, life is good, right? Uh, it's like that song. Remember that song? Summertime. And the living is easy, right? It's a great song. You know, the, the fish are jumping, the cotton's high. Your daddy's rich, ain't no reason to cry. That's what it said in the song. And that's probably a time when God's not testing your faith either. You see, God tests our faith during the, the difficult times. When the living is hard, when the fish aren't jumping, when the cotton got ate by the bull weevil, when you got no idea what's going on with your daddy or your mama, right? See, that's when God tests our faith. 
And I believe God tests our faith in, in different ways. I'm going to give you three right here. These are three ways that God tests our faith. Number one, it's called the, the pressure test. This, this test only has one question. How are you going to handle stress in your life when you are pushed to your absolute limit? How do you react when you get to what I call the POTD, the point of, of total desperation? Are you going to be like a pressure cooker that, that builds up heat and pressure until you finally just explode in anger? Or are you going to keep the lid on and trust God until the heat finally, finally calms down? See, that's the pressure test. That's A. And B, the people test. Everybody here is going to be able to relate to what I'm about to say. See, sometimes God, he puts people in our lives who absolutely stretch our faith, right? They rub us completely the wrong way. If you've got one exposed nerve, these kind of people, they don't just get on that one exposed nerve. They get on that exposed nerve and they grind on that exposed nerve, right? These people aren't hard to love, man. They are impossible to love. But because you're a follower of Jesus, you say to yourself, hey, Jesus loves them. And they're made in God's image just like me. And the question is, how are you going to handle that people test, right? Are you going to lash out at them? Are you going to strike out at them? Are you going to love them patiently with the same love that Jesus loved you with? That's the people test. And see... The persistence test. This test asks the question, am I going to maintain my commitments or am I going to quit? I guarantee you that when you're on a task for God, there, there is going to come a time where you are going to want to give up. The enemy is going to do everything he can to try and discourage you. Uh, sometimes you're going to look around and it's going to seem like every external factor indicates that you should give up, that you should throw in the towel. But listen, if God wants to move you out of there, he's going to move you out of there himself. Uh, a weak person always gives up too soon. But a wise person, they listen for God's guidance and they hang in to the very end of the commitment. And it doesn't matter which one of these tests God might be using on you, the pressure test, the people test, or the persistence test. If you pass the test, I guarantee you, God is going to reward you in a very rich way with that peace that transcends all understanding. Uh, uh, sometimes, uh, if you're, uh, I know some of you guys in here have a, little, have a few years on me today, but I, I remember when all we had was three TV channels, right? Uh, we didn't have cable TV. You had three TV channels, and they weren't on 24 hours a day. But do you remember back in those days, You'd be watching TV, maybe you're watching your favorite show, and all of a sudden you hear this noise, this static noise, like, and this would come up on your screen. Bam. Remember that? And they'd say, this is a test of the emergency broadcast system. This is a test. This is only a test. They want you to know, hey, don't panic. Don't go run into the bomb shelter. Don't start grabbing glasses of water and everything. This is only a test. Well, see... That, that's the way you and I have to look at these storms of life when they hit us. We've got to remind ourselves when we're in the midst of the storm, hey, this is a test. This is only a test. And that's going to take us to point number three today, and that's this. Storms force you and I to cry out to Jesus. Now, here's Jesus in this boat going across the Sea of Galilee with these 12 disciples, and we know that a few of these disciples had been uh, fishermen. And I imagine that these fishermen had seen some rough weather before. And so I'm pretty sure they were probably doing everything that they could to try and alleviate this situation, right? That maybe they trimmed the sails, right? Maybe they pointed the bow into the storm. Maybe they started to row on one side of the boat. Maybe they started uh, bailing water. But whatever, before too long, it became apparent that their resources absolutely weren't going to be enough. And that's when they cried out to Jesus. And do you remember how they did it? They woke Jesus up and they just said to Jesus, hey, don't you care if we drown? <laughs> that's how they said it, right? And that made it really obvious that it's not the storm they were afraid of. They were afraid of drowning, right? They were afraid of dying. And the same thing kind of happens with you and I when the storms of life hit us. See, what happens is a, a storm comes and it hits our lives. 
And suddenly you and I are thinking of the worst case scenario. I mean, we're thinking, oh, no, man, the boat's about to go down. The boat's going to sink. We're going to drown. And you know what I'm talking about, and we've all been there before. And when that happens, it usually ends up with us crying out to God, God, don't you care that I'm going through all of this? We ask it, but as followers of Jesus, I think in the back of our minds, we really know that God does care. We're saved Christians. We follow Jesus. We know this whole thing is a process. But God really does care. The book of 1 Peter again, chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Cast all your anxiety on him, that's God, because God cares for you. A while back I did a series of messages on phrases that people think are in the Bible, but they're not in the Bible. I did some of them up here. Uh, I spoke the whole series at a place down in the East End called The Warehouse, and I gave them at a little church down in uh, Flemingsburg, Kentucky. But one of the most common misquotes that, that people uh, misquote in the Bible, and actually I think it's the most common misquote that people use, is this one right here. They'll say, God will never give you more than you can handle. That's absolutely nowhere in the Bible. As a matter of fact, that goes against uh, uh, the Bible. Because again, God is not the author of evil. God does not give you what you can't handle. You and I, we live in a fallen world on this side of heaven, and you and I are in a fallen state. Even as saved Christians on this side of heaven, we're still in a fallen state. When we get something that uh, we can't handle, it, uh, it's because of that. It's because of the fall of man. But that, the actual verse where that comes from is right here in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, God is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. When trouble and adversity come, you see, sometimes God, again, is going to draw his hand back and he's going to allow you to be burdened to the point where you realize that you can't fix the problem on your own. You can't do it yourself. You need him. I mean, what if what if that had been the disciples attitude? What if they were fighting that storm, bailing water and, and they say, hey, you know, this is getting pretty bad, but let's not wake the Lord up. He's pretty tired, man. He's been, he's been working a lot lately. Let's just let him sleep. Well, because after all, God's never going to give us more than we can handle. Well, the minute they got done with that conversation, the next sound they were going to hear was like glub, 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 glub as they were sinking to the bottom of the ocean, right? What we used to call, when I was in the Navy, we used to call that the, the deep six, uh, Davy Jones's locker. Uh, uh, when life is unbearable, see, that's when you and I are forced to cry out to God. Now, the Apostle Paul, he understood this concept. He talked about his uh, personal trials in the book of 2 Corinthians. Look what he said. He said, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. You might be here today listening to this message, and you might be going through a desperate time right now. You're absolutely at your POTD, your point of total desperation. And you may be wondering, what should I do? Well, my advice to you is point number three right here. Cry out to Jesus. Give it to Jesus. He will never let you down. He will never let you go. He said he will be with you all the way to the end and beyond. Amen? Amen. That's going to take us to point number four, and that's this. Jesus is either going to calm your storm or he's going to calm you. But one of my favorite parts about this true account is that Jesus is up in the stern of this boat and he's sound asleep. And this teaches us several things. Uh, first of all, it teaches us that the human side of Jesus well, it got, he got fatigued just like you and I do. But we also see that Jesus possessed such a strong sense of tranquility that he could sleep even through a storm. And I want you to understand, this wasn't just any storm. Let's look at the word breakdown on this. The Greek word used for storm in these verses is the word seismos. That's how you say it. It's pronounced seismos. And it's defined as a commotion a shaking like an earthquake. It's actually where we get our word seismograph, which is an instrument used to detect and record earthquakes. 
So what I want you to see is this storm out here on the Sea of Galilee, this wasn't some ordinary storm at sea. This thing was absolutely extreme. I don't know if you've ever been in an extreme storm before. I have. I was, when I was in the Navy, we went into a squall out on the Atlantic Ocean. We couldn't outrun it. And our captain didn't have any choice but to turn that ship around and point the bow right into that wall of water. And I mean, we went in there and that thing was miles wide. Uh, our ship, it probably stuck out of the ocean about four stories and it was probably eight more stories under the water. And it was probably as long as the crew tower on its side. When we hit that storm, we were walking on the walls, man. You'd be on the floor one second, on the walls the next second. We were carrying 3,000 Marines. They weren't used to They didn't have their sea legs yet, and those poor guys were getting sick. And so, again, these extreme storms, they can be really rough. But what you and I need to see is, is that even though that storm was rough in the natural, there were two storms that were present that night. There was this meteorological storm that was happening outside, but there was this emotional storm raging on the inside of the hearts of the disciples. You see, they were filled with fear. And I'll tell you right now, fear can be, fear is worse. It can be more destructive and damaging to your life than any storm in the natural. Uh, there was this chicken farmer down in Tennessee, and he was losing chickens, and he was sure that a fox was getting into his hen house and killing his chickens. So one night when he went to bed, he loaded his shotgun, leaned it up against a wall, and he opened the window that was facing that chicken coop. And then he put on his nightshirt and got in bed. Well, sure enough, a few hours later, he heard some commotion out there in that chicken coop, and he got up and grabbed his shotgun and took the safety off, and with nothing on but his nightshirt, he started walking out toward that chicken coop. And as he's walking toward that chicken coop with that shotgun, he started thinking, what if this fox has rabies and he turns around and bites me? And then he started thinking, what if it's not a fox at all? What if it's a bobcat? Or what if it's a cougar? Or what if it's a wolf? Well, by now, he's got the gate to the chicken pen opened up, and he's got that shotgun pointed right there at that chicken coop. And his old hound dog came up and stuck his cold nose right up the back of his nightshirt. And bam, that gun went off. And he lost nine chickens that night. It wasn't the fox that killed him. And it wasn't that shotgun that killed him. It was fear that killed those chickens. Amen? Amen. And so here's Jesus. The disciples wake him up. Lord, don't you care that we're about to drown? Jesus looks at them and says, why are you afraid. And then Jesus gets up, and I, I, get, I just get this picture of Jesus getting up in this boat, storm going on, and he's just nonchalantly looks out at the wind and looks out at the waves and says, hush, be still. It's, it, it, it's the same words that a mother would use to a little baby, right? If she's rocking her baby and the baby's crying, and she looks down at that baby and she says, hush, be still. And it says in the scripture, as soon as he said that, there was complete calm. In some versions, it says there was great calm. But the actual word that's in the Bible, it means mega calm. It says that there was a mega calm. And I've seen calm weather before, but I don't believe I've ever seen mega calm. I don't think I've ever experienced that. And so what we see in our verses today, and remember, we're on point number four. Sometimes Jesus is going to calm the storm. Sometimes he's going to calm you. In this case, Jesus calmed the storm. But there's other times where Jesus doesn't remove the storm. But he still speaks those same words. And instead, he speaks those words to our troubled hearts. Right? He comes into our spirits through the Holy Spirit. And he says, hush, be still, be quiet. And see, when we trust him, that's when we experience that same mega calm. Again, that's when we experience that peace that transcends all understanding. Again, the Apostle Paul, he had a storm in his life that he called his thorn in the flesh. And if you remember the story, uh, 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 God didn't remove it, but God did give him the grace and the peace to live with it. Look how Paul described it in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. He said, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. 
Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. There's probably some of us in this room today who we've been asking God to take the storms in our lives away for a, for a long time, and he hasn't done that yet. But maybe if we'll just stop and listen with our spirits instead of with our pride, what we'll find is that God is offering us inner tranquility in the midst of our storm. And that's going to take us to our last point today, point number five. If Jesus is in your boat, you know you're going to make it through the storm. See, in the midst of this storm, the disciples, they've forgotten something. And a lot of times people read this true account and they don't catch this either. It's at the very beginning of this true account. Jesus said, let us go over to the other side. Now look at that again. Let us, that's the key two words right there. He's the creator of the universe. When the creator of the universe says, I'm going in this boat to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, there is nothing on heaven and heaven on earth or under earth that is going to stop that from happening, right? That's where our faith has to be. Uh, uh, the entire Roman army couldn't have sunk that boat. The devil and every one of his minions could not have sunk that boat. That boat was going to arrive on the other side of that lake with Jesus and 12 disciples intact because the living son of the living God spoke the word and said that it would. The good news for you and I today is this, is that Jesus has promised you and I, his followers, the exact same thing. He's promised us that we are going to make it through every storm in life as well if we'll just stay focused on him, if our faith will be in him. Now, God never promised you and I we'd live a storm-proof life, that's for sure. Jesus himself said, in this world you're going to have trouble, but he said, be of good cheer, take heart. He said, I have overcome the world. So again, God doesn't say we'll have a storm-proof life, but he does make us one other promise. He says, I'm going to be with you every step of the way through that storm. You can read about it in Isaiah 43, 2 through 7, but I kind of paraphrase this myself uh, for this message. And uh, this, in your mind, picture God saying this to you. You can read the verses in the Bible for yourself later. Here's God. He says, hey, when you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. When you're in rough waters, you will not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end because I am God. I'm your personal God. I paid a huge price for you. That's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. So don't be afraid because I am with you. I'll tell you what, I, I would rather be in any kind of storm, no matter what storm it is with Jesus, than to be on the outside of that storm without Jesus. And so the lesson of the storm, the, the, the verses we read today, it's a simple lesson, but it's a profound lesson. Jesus never promises you and I a smooth ride, but he does promise us a definite destination in the end. Amen? Amen. We're, on, we're, we're citizens of the kingdom of God already because we've put our faith in Jesus. We've trusted his sacrifice of love on our behalf, but we're still on our way to that physical kingdom to be with him forever and ever. And uh, I want to I wanna close up today with this. I want to talk about this is the, the greatest maritime disaster in history, the sinking of the Titanic, right? April the 15th, 1912. Uh, it wasn't a storm that sank the Titanic, right? It was an iceberg. But it wasn't just the iceberg. It was the pride of the people who built the Titanic because they said that that ship was unsinkable. And yet, really, that's the only thing that ship ever did. That's the only thing that ship is known for is the fact that it sunk. Uh, one of the survivors was a lady named Mrs. Sylvia Caldwell. Uh, she remembered that when she boarded the Titanic, the captain and some of the crew members were at the top of the gangplank to greet everybody. And she said to him, are you sure this ship is safe? And one of the crew members looked at her and said, Mrs. Caldwell, God himself couldn't sink this ship. Whew. So we all know the tragic story, right? What happened in their pride because they thought that ship was unsinkable. 
They didn't put enough lifeboats on the ship. There weren't enough lifeboats for everybody. Hey, why clutter up our pretty new ship with a bunch of lifeboats, right? 1,500 people died. But here's a part of this story that some of you may not know. The Titanic was actually built in Belfast, Northern Ireland. And uh, Belfast back in those days was not a big town. And everybody in Belfast had a part in building the Titanic. And so when news of the sinking of the Titanic reached Belfast, the entire town came out in the street and mourned and grieved. They were weeping. They were crying. They were mourning. Uh, grown men and women embracing each other, crying bitter tears. And the Titanic actually sank on a Monday. But the following Sunday at a little Presbyterian church, it was called Deary Presbyterian Church, uh, the pastor was about to give a message, and that church was extremely gr in, in an extreme way of grief because 16 men who were members of their church were engineers on the Titanic. They didn't just help build it. They were on the Titanic for that maiden voyage, and every one of those 16 men drowned in the icy waters of the North Atlantic. And that church was packed to overflowing that Sunday. Their pastor's name was Andrew Smith, and he preached on the very text that you and I looked at today. And he made an amazing statement to his congregation at the end of that message. This is what he said. He said, there was only one vessel in all the history that was truly unsinkable. It was the little boat occupied by the sleeping Savior. And the only hearts that can weather the storms of life are hearts that have Jesus inside. Remember the very last thing that happened in this true account we read about? The disciples asked a question. They said, who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? And it's an important question. Who is this man? Well, I'm going to try to answer it for you right here because it's an important question to all of us. So follow with me. He's Jesus. He's God's son. And you and I can trust him. The only way to describe him is that he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't outlive him. You can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't fault him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't conquer him. And the grave couldn't hold him. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's the first and the last. He's the beginning and the end. He's the God of the future and the God of the past. And there is no other name given among men whereby you must be saved. He is Jesus. And you and I can trust him. Amen? Amen. Amen. If there's anybody in the room today that's never put their faith in Jesus, if you want to receive him today, not just myself, but every Christian in this room will pray with you to receive Jesus. Is there anyone? You guys know me. You know I'm around here all the time. So if you're thinking about it, if your heart's beating real fast, just come and see me and talk to me and we'll talk about it. Uh, Father, we just thank you today and our faith is in you. We love you so much and we thank you that you are there with us through the storms of life. Lord, there's people in this room today that are battling things that I, that I can't even imagine. Maybe people even watching uh, the video today that are battling things that I can't even comprehend. Father, I just ask today that you be with them, Lord, that you touch them in a mighty way, that you bring to their spirit that peace that transcends all understanding. I pray that this word you put in me today somehow touches the heart of someone in need today. Let it be so. In Jesus' name, amen.